Hello, um, my name is Hannah Gully, and I've had POTS for eight years now, and this is my story. So before I developed POTS, I was a healthy, active, and involved kid. I, was in, uh, I played sports, I was in plays, um, I was really into school, and uh, I had an active social life, and things were pretty great, and that all changed one day for me. That day was October 1st of 2007. I was 17 years old and I sustained a concussion playing soccer. Um, my symptoms came on immediately. Uh, I was dizzy, lightheaded. Um, I had developed migraines, I had fatigue, and I was taken to the infirmary at my school and told by the doctor there that I would recover overnight. That did not happen. Um, I remained bedridden for three weeks. Um, the symptoms never relented. They are never lifted. They just continued and got worse. Um, I felt like I was drowning within my own body. Um, I was functioning at a level so low, like Wendy was saying, I couldn't make it from my bed to the bathroom. I couldn't even make eye contact without getting dizzy. I was uh, a shell of the person that I was just days before. Um, I made it back to school after a month, but only one class at a time. And I finished out that year, um, but my symptoms persisted and it was extremely difficult. So as you can see here, this is a list of my symptoms. Um, I think sometimes when someone's researching POTS, a doctor or a new patient, but mostly a doctor, and they're looking and they've never heard of POTS before, and they see a list of symptoms, sometimes it's easy to think, well, OK, they, this might not be so bad if someone's dizzy or you know, lightheaded and they're experiencing weakness and fatigue. You know, A lot of people think they can relate to those symptoms. They've had headaches. They've been tired. But it's to a whole nother degree um, when you have POTS. And even if you just had three of these symptoms on a chronic basis, it would be debilitating. So looking here, um, I've developed more symptoms every year that I've had POTS. I've divided this up by the first year, the following um, two to four years, and years four to eight. Um, no symptom that I have has ever resolved. It's just that the level and the severity has decreased at times, but um, I experience all these symptoms still today. So. One symptom that I want to spotlight is hypersensitivity. Now, I developed hypersensitivity immediately after the concussion to uh, touch, smell, sound, uh, light, food, and medication. But that sensitivity became more pronounced in year four when I sustained another concussion. Um, one of the most troubling aspects of the hypersensitivity was the hypersensitivity to my head. After that concussion in year four, if I had to stop hugging people. Um, if anyone touched my head, my body would react as though I had been concussed. Now, if it was just a rough hug or something, I would be in bed for a couple days. But there were several times um, where I would get hit by a kitchen cabinet or bump my head in the car. And I had to leave school um, three times, leave my job one time, because I got bumped. And my body reacted so intensely that I was bedridden again. And this was during the period when I was not diagnosed, so I had no idea what was going on. Um, after a, Another part of this is sensitivity to medication. I cannot tolerate almost any medication. I, Like I said, I've had POTS for eight years now, and I'm not on any medication to treat my POTS. Uh, any medication I've tried has made, you see like that symptom list that says, oh, these are rare, or these symptoms won't happen. That's generally me. I generally get those symptoms. Um, and really intensely, I'm sicker on medication than I am off, and it's just not worth it to me. Um, so I do not, I'm not on any medication. Also, food. Um, that concussion, that fourth year, triggered intense gastrointestinal issues. And as you've heard today, the patient community, the POTS patient community, is largely young females. It is not comfortable to talk about really debilitating, embarrassing gastrointestinal issues. These are so rough for anybody. And try being like 17, 20, and having all these things happening to your body like at any time. It's miserable. And 
I have digestive issues from as soon as food or liquid enters my body to when it comes out. And as you can imagine, there's always food in your body, so I am always in discomfort. So if you take a minute to look at this slide, it's, it's pretty humbling. Um, I spent six and a half years uh, with POTS without a diagnosis. This wasn't six years that I spent you know, thinking, okay, I'll get over this, you know, not really trying. This was six and a half years that I tried really relentlessly with my family to get an answer. Um, there were times when I gave up and thought, no one's taking me seriously, none of these doctors are taking me seriously. Um, and, you know, I've, I gave up hope at times, but my mom continued on and persisted, and she's the reason that I'm diagnosed today. Um, I had some really great doctors that really wanted to help me, but they just didn't know about POTS, and um, I saw 41, over 41 physicians. I went to over 27 medical facilities. I, had, I went to 19 ER visits. These medical facilities were in five cities, and I couldn't even count the number of appointments that I've gone to. Um, and these are just what I have documented when I was going through preparing this slide. There are more. These are the facilities that I went to before getting diagnosed. As you can see, there are a lot of big names on here. I'm from outside of Boston. And um, I went, I saw people at Beth Israel, um, at Mass General, at Children's Hospital, Mount Sinai in New York. Um, I saw a lot of really amazing doctors and a lot of really great people who really wanted to tell me but didn't have the answers. I also saw doctors like Wendy and Lauren have talked about that uh, didn't take me seriously. I, like you can see, I don't really look sick. I was 17 when I developed POTS. Um, I, was told it could be anxiety, PMS, that I was just an emotional teenager, that I get over it. Um, I had one doctor tell me that my symptoms were not scientifically possible and I must be making my illness up. <laughs> I didn't appreciate that. Um, so I, I wanna also emphasize, especially in a room that ha um, full of physicians, that I saw many different types of physicians. And before the age of 17, I was a healthy kid. Um, and then bit by bit over the six and a half years and still now, my body began to fall apart in all sorts of different ways. So if you look at this list, it's not just what you'd normally think of with a POTS doctor, cardiologist, a neurologist. Um, I saw gastroenterologists. I saw migraine specialists, dermatologists, um, all sorts of different people. And, and um, none of these people identified my symptoms as POTS related. And I think that it, it proves that we need to raise awareness not just in you know, cardiologists, neurologists, and primary cares. We need the medical community as a whole to understand this illness, to try to identify um, patients sooner, because it's really important. So I finally got, I heard the words autonomic nervous system malfunction and POTS um, after six and a half years in an appointment with Dr. Quo at Mass General Hospital. He was a gastroenterologist. He ordered autonomic testing, including a tilt table test, which came back abnormal. And he directed me to find a neurologist. I flew to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona four months later to see uh, Dr. Goodman, who is, has done research in concussions resulting in autonomic nervous system malfunction. Also, sorry if you note, I was there for two weeks. I saw seven doctors in that period of time. I had a battery of tests done, and I left with a POTS diagnosis, among others. Um, as Lauren talked about before, there are a lot of things that come along with POTS. Um, these are some of the ones that I experience. So this is something that really has stuck with me. Uh, like I said, it took six and a half years for me to receive a diagnosis. And I had every advantage a patient can have in trying to find and to get an answer. I have an incredible family that has stuck with me this entire time never doubted me and always fought for me even when I didn't have any fight left. Um, I have had the confidence and the education to challenge doctors when I feel like I, they're not understanding what I'm saying. I've had health care, the ability to pay for treatments that insurance wouldn't cover and fly to appointments. Um, and so what I wonder and what really worries me is that, okay, it took me six and a half years and I had all these advantages. What happens to someone who doesn't have one, two, three, or any of these things? Those patients are just simply never going to get diagnosed. And, and that just shouldn't be the case. So 
As you can imagine, developing a chronic and debilitating illness at 17 takes quite a toll on your social life. Um, I had POTS throughout high school and college. Um, one of the most difficult aspects of this was that I was undiagnosed for all of high school and college, and so I could not explain to my friends what was going on. A lot of my symptoms were weird, embarrassing, and unpredictable, and though I tried very hard to explain to my closest friends and to people I really cared about what was going on, because I couldn't explain it and I looked fine, um, people didn't believe me, I was met with a great amount of apathy, and um, basically there was I spent most of college without any friends. I'd spend days alone, um, very sick, and fighting to st stay in school. The financial burden has been tremendous for my family. Um, these are the areas in which it's really cost us. Um, but looking ahead to the future, I mean, I'm 25, and I have never been able to hold a full-time job, um, despite the fact that I'm fully prepared to do so. I've graduated college, and I really want to work and I'm ready to contribute, but because of POTS, I can't work full time yet, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to. But having POTS is like having a college tuition every year for the rest of your life, trying to pay for it, and care, and even if you try to minimize, it's extremely expensive to be sick, and then to not be making money, having a full time job, and have parents losing wages <coughs> from caring for you, it's, it's a tremendous impact to the whole community. <coughs> The emotional toll um, of being chronically ill is significant. I really want to emphasize that I did not have mental health problems before I developed POTS. Um, I was a happy kid, I was healthy, I had a great life, a great family, and I endured many years of having POTS without developing serious mental health problems because I was just pushing and pushing and hoping things would get better. But anxiety, I took a medication when I was still undiagnosed that triggered severe anxiety. And then over time, with my situation with POTS, I developed severe depression because I couldn't do pretty much anything and I was being wheeled around by my parents and living at home. Um, I struggled with suicidal thoughts. Um, I had to do a partial hospitalization program um, because I was so emotionally affected by being chronically sick. Um, I felt like I was 20 something going on 90 and that my life was basically over. So for me, diagnosis did not equal immediate improvement. Um, I tried all the things we've heard a lot about today, increased salt and fluid and compression stockings and all of that, but six months into my diagnosis, I was the sickest I had ever been. And I think that something that's important to know is that these lifestyle modifications, while so important, sometimes can't bring patients out of the most severe symptoms. And I despite everything, couldn't get out of it. Um, that's where the Mayo's Pain Rehabilitation Program in Rochester, Minnesota came in for me. This program saved my life. Um, it's not an exaggeration. Uh, I was in and out of a wheelchair when I arrived. And um, Dr. Gibbons talked about this earlier today. Um, so I won't go too far into it, but it, it was an intensive program that dealt with all aspects of your physical and emotional health and really gave a boost that I could not have gotten in any other way. I was surrounded by people who understood POTS and I trusted them to push me through symptoms because I knew that they would push me just the right amount. Anyone else who didn't understand POTS could make me extremely sick by pushing me too hard and in the wrong ways. And this was really the only framework in which I was able to get better. Um, the Mayo's approach is complicated and nuanced, and at times it feels pretty cruel, um, but I urge you, I can't do it justice here, I urge you to look up the program and learn about it because what they do is really incredible, and I was there with many of the, I was in the adult program, but many of the pediatric patients, like 75% were POTS patients, and to watch everyone's journey over the month there, um, it had a huge effect. So. Managing after the program has been challenging. They don't fix you, they don't cure you, they give you a boost you couldn't have gotten anywhere else, but it's up to you to continue on. It takes immense mental fortitude to make it through the program, a lot of people don't, and then to continue on. Um, I am now living independently um, and working part-time. I completed a 5K, um, but I'm still symptomatic every minute of every day. Like right now, I'm very dizzy, my vision's a little blurry, 
Um, my stomach feels terrible. I mean, I could list a few more things, but like, it's, I am functioning. I am not bedridden. I'm not in a wheelchair like I was this time last year. So since I've had POTS, I have been bedridden and wheelchair bound. I've been completely abandoned by most of my friends and I've spent a lot of time isolated. Um, but I never gave up and I refused to settle for a second rate life. Um, I'm not going to be let POTS dictate what I do. Um, there have been times when it's won, very much so. Um, but in between those times, I've fought for the things that matter to me. Um, while having POTS, I've lived in China, I've traveled around Europe, Central America, South America, um, around the States. I graduated with honors from Phillips Academy in Andover and Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Um, I managed a store of 40 employees, I interned in the US Senate, I worked in the Obama campaign, and now I sit on the Dysautonomia International's Patient Advisory Board. Um, I've managed to do all of this while being sick, and it's hard. I have to wake up every morning and decide to live my life. Um, I wake up pretty much every morning feeling like I have the flu, and I have to make the conscious decision not to let POTS win every day. So I can't fight this alone. There are so many people, even looking around this room, I recognize a lot of faces. I know there are so many people here that are affected by this illness tremendously, and there are so many of us. So what I need from you all from the physicians in the Boston area is to commit to edge awareness and action. Um, these are crucial steps. Uh, awareness, I mean, as Lauren said, the diagnostic delay has decreased. It is so important to get the diagnostic delay decreased. I waited six and a half years. No one should have to wait that long. There are other people who have waited longer than I have. We need to bring that down and try to help patients learn to manage their illness. We also need to commit to research and fundraising. Um, it's one thing to learn to manage your illness. It would be way better if we could cure it, and that's definitely possible. But we need to all band together to find a cure to POTS. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time, and thank you for being here.